Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are nearing the end of our study in the Gospel of Mark. We'll have one more lesson after this. I'll say something about that in just a moment, but this morning we're looking at Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. The Lord has been buried. Uh, It's been a hasty preparation for His burial. And now we read in verse 1 of chapter 16, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might come and anoint Him. Very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. They were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. They went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, many of your versions have a note after verse 8 stating that the earliest manuscripts do not contain the the verses that follow, verses 7 through 20. And many New Testament uh, scholars believe that Mark ended his gospel here with verse 8. It's an unusual ending, but the textual evidence would support that. And um, I think that that's probably the case, but still, verses 9 through 20 have been considered genuine by many and uh, godly people. They're part of, for example, the King James Version. And so we will end our series on the Gospel of Mark with those verses as our final um, lesson in, in that next week. Well, may the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's pray. Said, hopes are for the living, but the ones who die are without hope. That was the typical pagan belief about death, complete pessimism. Paul spoke of it to the Thessalonians when he described the rest who have no hope. Death ends everything. And modern man has no more hope than the ancient pagans. The English philosopher Thomas Hobbes spoke of his imminent death as a great leap in the dark. He spoke for materialists today. No hope. And so there is no greater news than the announcement given by an angel at the tomb of Jesus early one Sunday morning when he said, He has risen. He is not here. That's the message of Easter. It's the message of every Sunday. It's the message of the gospel that we carry with us every day. Death has been defeated. Christ has triumphed over the grave. That's the message that ends the Gospel of Mark with the empty tomb and the good news of the resurrection. It's the message of hope. The importance of the event cannot be overemphasized. It's the proof that Christ is who He claimed to be, the Son of God and that He accomplished what He promised to do, save His people. It is the cornerstone of the Christian faith, which cannot stand apart from the resurrection. 
Well, that being the case, it's really not surprising that the resurrection has been attacked as a fact of history from the beginning. The Jewish priests of the Lord's day denied that it happened on the day, the very day that it happened. In modern times, theologians have accepted the idea of the resurrection, but they've accepted it as a spiritual resurrection, not a bodily one. But the Bible is clear. It teaches the bodily resurrection of Christ. That is the only resurrection that could triumph over death and could establish the claims of Christ and His promise of salvation. It's what the disciples witnessed. In fact, Paul, who met the resurrected Jesus on the Damascus Road, states that if Christ was not raised from the dead, then we too are without hope in the world. Our preaching is in vain, he said. Your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. And we of all men are most to be pitied. Well, how is that? Well, most more to be pitied than the pagans? Well, the pagans have no hope. What a discouraging thing to have hope that's disappointed, that's empty. No, but Paul adds, Christ has been raised from the dead. In fact, he tells us that in addition to the 12 disciples, in addition to himself, more than 500 people could give testimony to that. He appeared to many at one time. That is the consistent testimony of the New Testament. It's Mark's testimony here at the end of the Gospel where he gives the account of some of those witnesses. And interestingly, the first witnesses who looked into the tomb and found it empty are a group of women. Now I call that interesting because Jewish culture at the time was patriarchal male-dominated, and placed very little value on a woman's testimony. You get a sense of that from some of the things that the rabbis wrote around that period of time, like, soon let the words of the law be burnt than delivered to women. And so the fact that Mark cites the witness of women first of all, supports the authenticity of the account. Why did he do it? Because it actually happened. If Mark had fabricated things, if, if this account were the, the propaganda of the early church, it's unlikely that he would have built his case on the testimony of women. He would have built it around men. But Mark gave the historical account. And what happened, in fact, is the men went into hiding for fear of their lives, and the women went to the tomb first. They had more courage than the men, but not more hope, which also supports the truth and the integrity of the account. They didn't visit the tomb expecting to find it empty or looking for the resurrection. They had no hope of that. Their hope had been taken away on the cross and sealed up in the tomb. That explains their visit to the gravesite early Sunday morning. They didn't come to see the living Lord. They came to complete a burial that was hastily carried out due to the approaching Sabbath. They came with spices to anoint Christ's body, to, to finish the burial rites. Mark lists the names of the women, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome. The, uh, the purpose of the spices was not to preserve the body from decay, but to offset the odor of decomposition. Now that's what they were expecting. They expected his body to decompose and turn to dust. But this was a final gesture of devotion, a way of honoring Him in His death. They came with courage, they came with love, but it was the kind of love that people have for martyrs who come to weep over their graves and remember them with sadness. That's how the women approached the tomb early Sunday morning. 
with devotion, but without faith and without hope and without any thought of a resurrection. But again, that too supports the integrity of the account in the face of some modern criticism. Skeptics have, uh, have argued that reports of the resurrection were due to hallucinations brought on by great expectations people had that the Lord would rise from the dead. But that doesn't fit the facts. It doesn't fit the record of Mark's gospel or any of the gospels. The text is very clear. The women didn't have any such expectation. In fact, Mark states that when they were going to the tomb, their concern was with the stone that had been rolled in front of it. Verse 4 describes it as extremely large. And they were concerned about the difficulty of rolling it away and the need of finding someone to help them with it so that they could enter the tomb and, and carry out these rites of burial. And yet, while they had no expectation of the resurrection and no expectation of finding the tomb empty, they had every reason to. Psalm 16, verse 10, prophesied the resurrection. Peter cites that on the day of Pentecost as a fulfillment of prophecy. The Lord Himself taught it. On at least three occasions, Jesus told His disciples that He would be arrested and He would be killed, but He would rise from the dead. In Mark chapter 8, verse 31, he said that it would happen after three days. Matthew records that even the priests remember that he had taught that, and taught that he would rise on the third day. They asked Pilate to post a guard at the tomb so the disciples couldn't steal the body. Well, that wasn't going to happen. The disciples weren't plotting anything. Uh, they were in hiding. They weren't thinking of a resurrection. Uh, neither they nor the women understood the Lord's words. Now they should have. Unbelievers understood it. The priests understood it, but the disciples didn't. So they were in hiding and the women went to the tomb, sad, carrying a load of spices, worrying about the stone, worrying about problems that didn't exist, carrying a load that was unnecessary. Now, there's a lesson in that picture because when we don't listen to the Word of God, when we don't understand the Scriptures, we take on burdens that are unnecessary and we worry about problems that often don't exist. In truth, I think we often differ little from these women when we face challenges. And I suspect that we might have responded in a similar way had we been there on that Sunday morning. I suspect we would have responded exactly the same way. We save ourselves a lot of grief when we pay attention to the Bible, the Word of God, and believe it. It's when we don't that we lose perspective and we lose hope. And let's not be idealistic or unrealistic and unfair. Even those with strong faith have times of deep distress and doubts. Life's hard. Life's full of challenges and spiritual and emotional struggles. That, that is all part of the pilgrimage we're on through this world. It's not an easy life that we've been called to. But... The resurrection of Christ is the proof that we have no reason for despair. It is the measure of what God can do for us and what He in fact will do for us. God's already defeated death for us. What then is left in life that is too difficult for Him? What obstacle can we face that is too great for Him to overcome and remove? If he conquers death, there is absolutely nothing that's too difficult for him. And so rather than carry burdens and worries that are unnecessary, we should cast our cares on him who cares for us and who raises the dead. That's Peter's counsel in 1 Peter 1, or rather 1 Peter 5, verse 7. 
Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. And that word casting has something of the, the idea of roll them onto him. All of those troubles and all of those trials, he bears them all. But that was Peter's counsel after witnessing the resurrection. On this Sunday morning, Peter was as despondent as these women we can see ourselves in all of them, and we can learn from their experience. What they learned before too long was how inappropriate their spices and worries were. Because when they arrived at the tomb, they saw that the stone had been rolled away. Now Mark doesn't explain how the stone was removed. The fact that he describes it as extremely large suggests very clearly that it was moved supernaturally. But the women didn't arrive at that conclusion. They saw the clear evidence of the resurrection, but didn't come to an understanding of it. Neither did they conclude that they had come to the wrong tomb, as some of the critics have argued that they did. Now, they knew right where they were. They they uh, went into the tomb to carry out the task of anointing the body. They had no doubts of where they were. But when they did, when they entered the tomb, they found no body. That was the reason the stone had been moved. Not to let Christ out, but to let the women in. The Lord's body was such that it could pass through stone, just as it passed through closed doors. So the stone was moved, not for his sake, but for theirs, so that the women and the disciples could see that the tomb was empty. Now, it was not altogether empty. The grave clothes were still there. John makes much of that in his account, how they were undisturbed. There was uh, also a young man in the tomb. Now that's how Mark describes him, sitting at the right, wearing a white robe. He was an angel. Mark doesn't identify him in that way, but his appearance, his apparel indicates it. He was wearing a white robe. Now that's an understatement. Matthew calls him an angel and describes his appearance as being like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. Luke calls it dazzling clothing. He terrified the Roman guards when he came and rolled away the stone. They shook for fear, Matthew says, and became like dead men. Now that gives us some idea of what angels are like. They're not like these little cherubs who flutter around. Uh, they're spectacular beings. In fact, they're so majestic, so glorious, that to see them makes one fall down as a dead person. John explains that or had that experience in the book of Revelation. He fell down to worship the, uh, the angel. The angel had to tell him, don't worship me. Well, that tells you how glorious these beings are. But for all of that, angels are never the point or the focus. They're simply servants, messengers, of the Most High God. And Mark downplays the angel because his importance is only as a messenger. He is the link between the women and the resurrection. They had not seen it. He had. They came to the tomb, found it empty, were amazed by what they found, but didn't understand it. In fact, it seemed bad to them. What had happened to the body, they wonder? Had it been stolen? Who had taken it? This is, this is what they thought. They, they were puzzled. They were discouraged. And so the angel encouraged them. He encouraged them with light. This is not bad, he says. It's good. Do not be amazed, he said. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who has been crucified. In other words, you've come to the right place. This is the right tomb. And you should be looking for Him. But He's not here. He has risen. Then he invites them to look at the evidence. Behold, here is the place where they laid Him. And they could see the tomb was empty. 
But that didn't explain things. An empty tomb only invites the question, why is it empty? What happened to the body? They needed an explanation. They needed an interpretation. They needed light. And that's what the angel gave them. He was God's gracious provision for them. And his explanation is the resurrection. That's what happened. Walter Wessel, who's one of the commentators on the book of Mark, wrote, <clears throat> Across the centuries, many other explanations have been proposed. The body of Jesus was stolen. The women came to the wrong tomb. Jesus did not actually die on the cross, but walked out of the tomb, etc. Some of them have had success with skeptics. But the only adequate explanation is that what the angel is that is what the angel said to the women who were at the tomb on the first Easter morning, he is risen. And we can broaden that principle regarding the necessity of revelation, of light being given to include everything, not just the resurrection, but everything we need to know. We can infer from nature that there is a God and we are His creature. Psalm 19 speaks of that. We look at the glory of nature, the order of nature, and, and we, we know intuitively that there is a God from the, the greatest galaxies to the smallest microbes. Every part of the universe is actually a universe in and of itself. It's amazing as we study these things. But uh, that's general revelation, and it can just take us so far, and not really very far, other than we know there is a creator, and we know we're creatures, but beyond that, we need what's called special revelation. We need the Word of God to know the great truths and questions of life, why we're here and where we're going. And that's why the Bible is such a great gift, why it's such a necessary thing for us. It reveals those things. It reveals the nature of God. We can know that there is a God, but what kind of God is He? We, we can know that we're creatures, but we need to know what kind we are. And God is a trinity. We learn that from the Word of God. He's just, but He's also gracious. We learn that from the Word of God. Man is fallen. We know man has problems. Anyone can look at the human condition, oh, something's not right. This is bad. This is not good. But why is that the case? The Word of God explains it. We're fallen creatures. We need a Savior. Christ is that Savior. He's the Son of God. That's what the Word of God teaches us. So we need it. Paul indicated that when he made that statement in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, when he speaks about what he received these are not things that he gleaned from nature or just his own meditation. He received that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. This is how we know these things. It's through the Word of God. It is God's great gift to us, and it is not only a gift, it is a necessity for His people. Well, this statement that Paul made in 1 Corinthians 15 is the message of the angel here. He has risen. He's not here. Then he told the women to go and tell the good news to the disciples and to Peter. Now, Peter is one of the disciples, of course, but he singled out because he needed special attention. He denied Christ three times. The Lord had warned him but he rejected the Lord's words. And there again, we have the problem of not hearing, listening to the Word of God and heeding it. Had he heeded the Word of God, his response to the trials that he faced would have been very different. But he didn't. And when he made his third denial and the rooster crowed, Mark said he remembered those words and he began to weep. We know from... The other accounts said he wept bitterly, and no doubt the tears fell all through the Sabbath. But with this announcement, 
the Lord was reassuring Peter that he loved him and that his denials, and in fact all his sins, were paid for on the cross. That's true for every believer. He receives all who turn to him and is quick to forgive because on the cross he paid for our sins in full and he cast them, as uh, Micah said, into the depths of the sea, never to be seen again, never to come up and accuse us again. They're gone. So the Lord can forgive the worst of sinners. And that's what the resurrection is about. It's about forgiveness and hope. The hope of life forever. It is the message of victory and joy. There there is no greater news that has ever been entrusted to people than this. And you would think that the women would hardly have been able to contain themselves for joy. But we read in verse 8, they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had gripped them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Well, as I indicated in the beginning and the, during the reading of the Scriptures, there is good evidence that this is where Mark ended his Gospel, that the remaining verses in the chapter were a later addition that had been made because this seems like an insufficient ending. And it does seem incomplete. But the oldest manuscripts support the ending here, and it gives a realistic and reverential end to the account. The women had come to the burial site expecting none of this, an empty tomb, an angel in dazzling apparel, and the greatest news of the greatest event of history. And it was staggering to them. Suddenly, they're, they're, they're to take a 180 degree turn, and they couldn't do that. They, they were confused. It took them some time to, to get their senses together. That's altogether natural. I think it's a further testimony to the accuracy of the, the account. The, the, the first messengers sent out don't give their message. Everything about this has the ring of truth, not the sense of propaganda. Well, not long after they left the tomb, they regained their composure and they told the disciples and told them what they had seen, what they had heard, told the disciples and many others for that matter. But Mark leaves it with the women's silence and the empty tomb to emphasize the mystery and awesomeness of the resurrection and emphasize the greatness of God and the weakness of man. These are not things that we can do in our own strength to be a missionary, to be one who bears the message to anyone across the globe or across the street takes supernatural power. It's not within us. This is the great hope that we have, though. The empty tomb is the greatest symbol of hope and the greatest proof that our hope is real. That's the vision Mark wanted to end on, the empty tomb. As Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1 and verse 4, it is proof with power that Christ is God's Son. He is God become man. The resurrection proves that Christ is true. It happened as He said it would. It proves He is the Savior and that God the Father had approved of what He did and accepted His sacrifice for sinners. The resurrection is the announcement of victory. And here, that is in the Gospels, in the accounts of the Apostles, we get the meaning of it. The resurrection doesn't save. Nowhere in the New Testament do we read Christ rose for our sins. We read Christ died for our sins. He suffered the penalty of sin in our place and in that way removed our guilt, obtained our forgiveness, 
secured even our faith to believe and conquer death for every believer. Now, all of that happened on the cross. The resurrection was God's announcement of victory. So we should never regard the cross as a defeat and the resurrection as victory. The cross was the victory won, the resurrection, the victory proclaimed. But because the cross was a victory over sin, over death, over the devil, it had to end in life, not death. And because it did, we have a living Savior, not a dead martyr, which might be inspiring, but is not a Savior at all. Only a living Savior could apply to us the benefits and blessings that He won on the cross through His sacrifice, which He does through the Holy Spirit, who enables us to believe and to live by His power. Only a living Savior can watch over us and guide us through the decisions and the dangers and the maze of this life. And He does that. He does that from a position of power, seated at the right hand of God, enthroned in power. So the one who stilled the storms on the sea, who healed the sick and comforted the troubled hearts, is alive, and He is alive for us. In fact, He is alive in us. Christians live now with the life of Christ. We live with what Paul described in Philippians 3, verse 10, as resurrection power. That's the Christian life. It's a supernatural life. We experience it as we walk by faith day by day. And ultimately, we will experience it physically as well in our own bodily resurrection. That is when, as Paul put it in 1 Corinthians 15, 54, death is swallowed up in victory. That is the Christian hope. It is a certain hope. The resurrection was an historical event. As a result, death is not a great leap in the dark. It is the gate of heaven. One of the old Puritans, Thomas Goodwin, spoke of death, which he had once feared as the sunbeam upon the valley and a smiling friend. Well, that is perspective that Theocritus didn't have, that pagans never had, and that non-believers cannot have. They cannot see beyond this life. They cannot see beyond the material. All who die, they say, are without hope. What hope the world gives is for this life alone. And men will sell their souls for it, for for money, for position, for pleasure, for any number of things. And when they get it, if they get it, they have it for only a moment. And then death swallows all. started reading through Isaiah in my, reading, my schedule of reading through the Bible in a year, and I came to Isaiah 5 verse 14, and there death Sheol is described like this gaping mouth that swallows everything. That's death. It takes it all. Everything a person may accumulate in this life is gone. That. The good news is there is hope, eternal hope, peace with God, forgiveness of sin, a clean slate, a clean life, a life that is everlasting. And the proof is the resurrection. That's what Mark tells us with this abrupt ending. The empty tomb. He's alive. That's our hope. This world is not all there is. The grave is not the end. There is a kingdom to come and a glorified world without end. That's our future. 
We have it because we have a living Savior. There are two lines of solid evidence for that. The first is the Bible. It's what we're reading. It's what we're studying. This is the first line of evidence for that. The Old Testament prophecies that are fulfilled in Christ and in the resurrection, the gospel accounts and the epistles, all of the historical, all of the documents of the Word of God, which are historical documents, attest to this truth. They are God's revelation. They're not fanciful. They, they are reasonable, rational accounts of what happened. And because they are revelation, they are self-authenticating. They ring true. They ring true for the man, woman, or child who has ears to hear and eyes to see. But secondly, we have the living evidence of a changed life, of your life. And that is incontrovertible evidence, just as the Scriptures are. Every believer is a new creation. That's a fact. That's a reality. And, and we live every day with resurrection life. So people ought to see that in us. We, we are the proof. Our, our lives ought to be lived with hope in hard times. Lives that, that exhibit the, the joy of knowing that our sins are forgiven and that we are bound for glory. We're bound for the promised land. Regardless of what happens here, we have that hope, and it's a certain hope. That ought to fill us with joy. A few weeks ago, Mark Newman finished uh, his lesson on Acts 19 and had the account of the riot in Ephesus and the response to that. Um, and at the, toward the end of his lesson, he quoted a, a survey that George Barna had made over number of years, I guess, and with lots of statistics to support it. And what the study showed is that believers and non-believers living together, Christians and non-Christians, show very little difference. They're pretty much the same. They think alike, they dress alike, they act alike. And I don't know that that meant they live um, immoral, dishonest lives, but I took it to mean they just don't distinguish themselves. They blend in. And that ought not to be. That itself is a scandal. And I think Mark went on to point out, or maybe Barna went on to point out, that we need to engage in the battle. We need to stand firm. We need to be set apart from the world. In, in a world that is full of despair, it ought to see hope in us so that it wonders about that hope. It wants to know about it. What is it? And we can tell them about Christ's death and resurrection and the hope that every believer has. We have changed lives. So if there's anyone present here with us who wants that, you can have it very simply through faith. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Christ has done it all. He finished it at the cross. That's what He said. It is finished. That was a cry of victory. I've done it all. I've completed it all. It's now to be received by those for whom I died. If you want that, Come to Christ. Trust in Him. He is God's Son who died for sinners. The proof is He was raised from the dead. Believe in Him and you will be saved. That's good news. News of hope. So we invite you to come and then by God's grace, may we not be silent. But tell of the goodness of God. Tell the Gospel and live it. Well, why don't we conclude with a hymn that we all love, I think, in the Songs of Praise book, hymn number 18, In Christ Alone, and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn Father, we do thank You for the truth of these things that we have read, the truth of the resurrection, uh, the empty tomb, which is the great evidence of it, the proof of it. What a blessing it is. It's the 
declaration of victory. The victory of the cross is proclaimed with the empty tomb. We thank you for that. Thank you that you have received your son's sacrifice on our behalf and that through faith in him and him alone we have all the blessings of that imputed to us. The forgiveness of sins, the righteousness of Christ, we're clothed in that. We are absolutely secure for all eternity and we have new life. We have the life of Christ within us by the Holy Spirit and we actually live supernatural lives. Help us to understand that and help us to walk by faith and to be a real witness of these great things that we have studied. May it be apparent in our lives. Thank you for Christ and we pray these things in His name. Amen.